Hello again. It may come as no surprise to some of my subscribers that I love wordplay. I think that the English language is so malleable and opens so much fun in the form of double entendres, ambiguities, words with double meanings and even sometimes in the way words are pronounced. As an example, the simple sentence, what is this thing called love, can also be iterated as, what's this thing called love? Um, malapropisms can be fun too, where a similar sounding word is used in a sentence, which turns it into a nonsense, such as, what are you incinerating? Don't throw nasturtiums at me, or he's just a wolf in cheap clothing. Even the old tongue twisters can cause hysterics when repeated in company. Try saying Irish wristwatch a few times quickly, or I'm not the pheasant plucker, I'm the pheasant plucker's son. I'm only plucking pheasants until the pheasant plucker comes. But some of the funniest moments can be derived from simple spoonerisms. As most people know, spoonerisms are named after the Reverend Spooner, who was Dean of New College in Oxford in the early 1900s. He is reputed to have been the unintentional master of the verbal flip-flop, um, transposing letters or syllables, either accidentally on, or on purpose, can produce some hilarious results. Reverend Spooner once accused a student of fighting a liar in the quadrangle. To another, he said, you hissed my mystery lecture, and told yet another that he had tasted two worms. I can remember even as a child that my dad often used to drop spoonerisms into his everyday conversations, such as, it's roaring with pain outside, you'll heed a gnat. And I suppose I picked up on the habit, and sometimes drive peers bonkers with it, but I still do it regardless. So, if I lapse into the occasional somersault of words in this tad sale, I hope you won't accuse me of being a shining wit. If I go back in time, I have to admit that I did dry tapes with girls, but they never really worked out. One of my first girlfriends was a gubby turl who loved to stake her shuff on the dance floor. The trouble was, she would often come off with Betty swoobs and promptly hop between them with a manky. Not a pretty sight. I once dated a lady plumber because my mates thought that she had tall kits. I remember my mate at the time being slightly envious and saying to me, you fly old socks. I mean, it wasn't that I didn't make an effort. I used to dress in a suit and most people would say, now there goes a fart smeller. I would take her for crimes in the duntry and if we passed a village pub, I would often take a dot in the shark and say, do you want to drop for a stink? We once stopped at one that had a lovely restaurant banked on the tack. We decided to eat, so we found a table for two in a nosy cook. It was right quomantic, with towers round the flabel and jandals in those little cars. The waiter poured me a drink from a scuttle of botch, and she had tea martinis. We scanned the lewd fist and foes our chewed. She had stump break with parrots and keys, and I had do and stumplings. Real mice kneel. We whacked our states for the plater, along with the fives and norks, and bathed the pill. It had put her in the mood for love, so as we strolled back to the car and the sun was vetting over the sally, she motioned for us to have a buddle on the cack seat. We kissed and cuddled for a while until the windows keemed up in the star and we explored each other's crooks and nannies. I suppose it's nice to get in the nude, even though she was game, no amount of her whispering fire truck was going to spark me into action. Oh, it did happen on rare occasions, but it's a lot easier when you're hung and yawny. I suppose looking back, I was a bit of a quizzy dean for trying, really, but I was never sure of a girlfriend in those days. Part of it was just the feed to knit in, and part of me also thought that the door I mated, the more likely I was to find one who fit my liars of desire. I had to eventually admit that it was never knowing to happen, I'd like boys since I was one, and remember often being teared up by the gleachers for wearing out of the stindo at the boys on the football pitch outside. Oh, those shite torts and luscular megs were such a distraction. And so it came to pass, by the time I was 21 I decided to try the day gating scene. The first dime was a bit taunting, and I met some strange characters, but that cursed fist from a butte coy was all it took. 
I was on nowed climb and I knew I could never look back. Being dragged onto the flance door by a, a bansom hoe for a small slooch was to me the highlight of my nigh day frights and natter day sights. Like post meeple I flayed the peel for a while until I eventually found my loo trove. It was one of those tragical mimes, the sluzik mowed down and everyone else in the room seemed to wade to fay. He was wearing tight Thievi Live O1s, you know, the ones with the flut and buys, and they showed off his perfect bound rut. His hair opt over one fly, and he flashed me a smeeming bile across the floor. I danced with him for a while, and once we fleffed the law and tarted stalking, we just stood and cop. He flamed back to my cat that night, and just never went home. Now all I had to do was sell my parents. They'd never understand, I thought. Do you? <laughs> Quickly, or... Uh, I'm not the pheasant plucker, I'm the pheasant plucker's son. I'm only for... <laughs> Take two. Just as a footnote to the spoonerisms, um, given all the news on Angelina Jolie and Brad Pitt's baby, they obviously weren't thinking of spoonerisms um, at the time they named their baby Shiloh Pitt. <laughs>